leadership, culture, change, innovation. What does it take to truly grow and succeed in both your professional and your personal life? On today's episode of the Work Inspired Podcast, we are so fortunate to be talking with Alexandra Trower, who is the EVP of Global Communications for the Estee Lauder Companies. Her knowledge, wisdom, and advice are truly next level. I know that you won't only enjoy this conversation, but you're gonna take away so much from it. So let's not waste another minute. Work Inspired starts right now. Alexandra, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's such a pleasure to have you on and really excited to talk and to talk to you and learn from you. Oh, thank you so much, George. I'm really thrilled you asked and excited for our conversation. So, so let's start by getting to know you a little bit. Tell me a little bit about your professional background, what you're passionate about, what you're interested in. Love to uh, kind of set the stage by getting, getting to know Alexandra a little bit better. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is my career happened a bit by accident. Mm -hmm. And I think women of, uh, of my generation, I graduated from college in the, in the late 80s, um, sort of were led to believe that your career had to take a very linear path. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the great things that we've seen is that actually some of the greatest careers can actually take place on a bit more of a crooked path. Um, I graduated from an amazing college, a women's college in Virginia called Hollins, where um, I was an English and French major and actually led to believe I could do anything I put my mind to. And I actually believed that. So I was uh, set out into the world and with very in a very good place, always wanted to live in New York and always said I wanted to work in magazines. And after an internship, um, ironically now at Working Woman Magazine as an assistant to the a beauty director, mm. and I'm now just in beauty, um, I realized that magazines were probably not for me and that mm. the, the pace wasn't as, as fast as I had hoped for and it wasn't sort of as compelling. And so I did something that at the time um, was called corporate communications. And uh, an older friend of mine and mentor said, there's a field called corporate communications, and it's very similar to editorial, but you get to do it for a company. Mm. And that was really intriguing to me. So I started my career at um, a division of Citicorp Investment Management. And, and I say that, and I think one of the things that's important for your, your viewers and listeners is that I actually didn't have any experience in financial services. I was didn't study economics. Um, I wasn't an accounting person, but I was someone who loved to learn, mm -hmm. um, could communicate well, and was passionate about doing a fantastic job. So I started out as a marketing associate. And again, that's another sort of lesson learned. I was the young woman that was actually behind the, in those days, the Xerox machine making the presentations for the portfolio manager. So I, I had a lot of um, un, unglamorous work. Um, but I also, I think most importantly for me there, and what was really a key to my uh, future success was I love people. Mm -hmm. And I, I relationships with people are really, really have been always and, and are still to this day very important to me. And so I built relationships with the people I was working for and um, and had really wonderful open lines of communication. And so one day I went into a portfolio manager who I think was actually going to talk to Chicago Fire and Police, a mm -hmm. pension fund. And I had been working on his presentation and his presentation had you know, something with the sharp ratio on, on the first few pages. And I thought, you know, is, is this really going to be understood by your, by his audience, right? Are the firemen and the policemen who have entrusted their pension money to our firm and to this gentleman really going to understand what we're talking about? And are they really going to have a connection on a head and heart level? And I thought the answer was no. Um, he challenged me to actually come up with a better way and I accepted the challenge. And, and that was really the start of my career. So I was mm. um, 12 years in asset management communications there, went through a lot of ownership changes and just kept raising my hand to say, I can do more. And then was um, at JP Morgan um, and then at Bank of America, two mm. fabulous and very different experiences. And finally, I've been so fortunate to spend the last 13 years at the Estee Lauder companies running global communications. So from finance to beauty, 
uh, it seems, you know, from the outside looking in to be a significant switch of industries. How, mm-hmm. how did you make that jump over? And, and, and are there, are there similarities? Were you able to bring things from the, uh, you know, the, the banking world into the beauty world? You know, it's a great question. And the answer is, is absolutely. And, and I will just start by admitting something to you. Um, I actually had a lot of hubris when I joined Prestige Beauty. Uh, I thought, what could be harder than financial services and investment banking and dealing with things like Enron and Senate hearings um, and challenging mergers? And I was so, I had always loved beauty, always admired the Estee Lauder companies, but I really thought my days were going to be spent um, wearing beautiful makeup and clothes and having lunch with beauty editors. (laughs) And that is definitely a big part of the job. Um, It's also talking to China at seven in the morning about uh, animal testing. It's also Mm. talking about ingredient formulations and product formulations and how we're going to grow our business and um, how I was going to get to uh, expand the work of my incredible team. So I very quickly um, learned that beauty was one of the most complex and intellectually Mm. challenging and really fascinating businesses. And so I think one of the things that I was able to bring to beauty um, and to bring to the Estee Lauder companies, and remember, we're a family company um, that was started 75 years ago, and the Lauder family is still the controlling shareholder, and we're, we're publicly traded. So it's a more complex organization structurally, and um, the benefit of being able to work with the Lauder family firsthand is just something that's extraordinary. I mean, they are an amazing group of people, and I have learned and continue to learn so much from each and every one of them. And I actually remember Leonard Lauder asking me the question of, what from financial services pertains to beauty. Mm. And I was fortunate enough to be in asset management. Now, in asset management, whether it's for uh, institutional investment uh, funds or if it's for individual investors or if it's for high net worth investors, it's really all about aspiration. Mm. It's really about hopes and dreams and helping people to realize their best financial lives. And beauty is very similar. And that Mm -hmm. beauty is about helping people be their very best in their own terms. And so I think that those qualities of aspiration and just humanity really were things that I was able to to take forward. And also just a huge curiosity to learn more, which Mm -hmm. I I do every single day. Uh, That makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned... You mentioned the 75 year old family, you know, business that is Estee Lauder. And then I think 25, 26 years ago, you went public. Yes. Uh, we talk a lot about culture on this podcast, and I'd be very interested to, to, to dive a little deeper to find out, did, what is the culture like? Let's start there. What's the culture like currently at Estee Lauder as a company? Well, it's a, it's a fabulous question, and I would say it all goes back to Estee Lauder and the Lauder family. Mm-hmm. We are a company where values and quality and integrity are absolutely paramount and central to everything we do. And I think it really, really starts there. And um, it flows out to every single employee in the entire company. It's how we interact with our consumers, how we bring new products to market, and most importantly, how we conduct our business and how we treat each other. And Mm -hmm. um, I often say to my team, I know that I've got one of the best teams in the business anywhere. And one of the things that makes them so special is not only are they expert in in what they do, but the how they carry out their responsibilities uh, reflects the values and um, and the and the care towards that the company is really famous for. Hmm. And that's what I was thinking is that a lot of the kind of the culture is that traditional, it's the family values. It's probably some of the way that you differentiate, I would say, and certainly the way that you structure and lead your team, the kind of those fundamental values at your organization. Did any of that change when you went public or has any of that changed over the course of more than seven decades? 
Well, it's it's a great question. What I would say is we have always been about winning and mm. we've always been about really bringing our consumers the very best. Mm. And I think that um, that has just gotten more and more powerful and sharper and sharper. And I really do believe what is unique about us is that we have been able to marry our culture of integrity, values, caring with a winning culture. Mm -hmm. And the combination, if you look, for example, at our stock price over the last 13 years, um, 13 years ago, I think we were $23 a share. Um, Today, we're close to $300 a share. Um, We're on track to becoming a $25 billion in sales company by 2025. And many of the things that brought us um, to going public in 1995 are the things that continue to make us so strong and so powerful today. And I think the most important thing is how we treat each other and how we treat our consumers. And we're bringing our consumers products that they love products Mm -hmm. that they can't live without and products that they know that they um, don't know yet, but they won't be able to live without going forward. And that's a really special place. Yeah. I I was thinking when I was thinking about the culture at your organization, I mean, you've got the family to going public aspect, the structure of the business, you've got um, the length of time you've been in business and just that period, you know, that, that extended period of time. And then you've also got the global nature of your business that you guys do business in so many different countries. Is the, is the culture, does the culture, is it a consistent thread throughout the entire organization? Because I mean, some of the things like integrity, caring, winning, those are things that really do transcend geographies, right? Uh, Those values. But do you have to make shifts, you know, to be locally relevant when you look at different, different, you know, countries in which you do business? You know, that is such a great question. And I think it's actually a really important lesson for all of us to remember. Mm. Um, We can't import everything we do from the General Motors building in New York City to the rest of the world. Um, We listen a great deal and we work very hard to ensure that how we conduct our business and how we serve our consumers is locally relevant. Mm. And that really, again, though, goes back to our values because it's really all about respect. It's all about respecting Um, our employees and our consumers and different ways of working around the world. So as we're creating, for example, um, new products um, or new programs, we make sure that not everything is just created in our in our little corner of New York City. Um, Many, many things actually emanate. It could be from Paris. It could be from London. It could be from Shanghai. um, It could be from Brazil. And it's really, really important not to assume that just because something works for one consumer base or one employee base, or even if we can, I think, take this down to our personal lives, um, we've got to really understand who we're talking with Mm -hmm. and um, respect where they're coming from and and take the time to actually learn Mm -hmm. about what works for them and what's important to them and what they care about. And I think that is really a key to um, beginning a successful anything, whether it's a mm-hmm. relationship or a business career. Yeah, it's great. I've also, I've also from talking to other you know global business leaders heard that when you're able to do that effectively and listen and be locally relevant, it's not only good for that locale, but it's also good for the entire organization because you're picking up, ideas and, 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 um, and parts of those cultures that can really foster innovation and make you a a more well-rounded company and really improve your perspective. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that, um, Estee Lauder herself did was when she, um, was, was starting her business, she actually went into the, uh, bathroom cabinets of her female friends hmm. to see what they actually had and what they actually used and what colors resonated. And we actually still do that today. Um, our CEO, Fabrizio Freda, who's just been magnificent, um, 
really believes in understanding what our consumers want and what our consumers are doing. And so um, we've been absolutely known to having um, trips with our executive leadership team where we were spending lots and lots of time with our consumers really going into their homes and and being invited to see um, what it is they they loved, what it is they they wanted more of. And you're exactly right. That's where innovation starts. And and I'll give you a a great example. There's something that um, is used a great deal in countries like Japan and China and Korea, and it's called watery lotion. And it is an absolutely fundamental part of the skincare ritual of women from those countries. And I don't want to generalize, but if you look at the the skin of um, those women from Korea and China and Japan, and they actually have something like seven to 12 steps, where in the United States, we most women have about three steps at most, um, their skin certainly benefits from mm. the use of watery lotion. So when we had that insight years ago, we were able to quickly pivot. And again, being able to move and respond quickly is such an important part of a successful business to bringing watery lotion um, to our consumers all around the world. Mm. A cool story for sure. You had said going into someone's home and it made me think of all the changes that have happened over the last 12 months here with the COVID-19 crisis and the pandemic. Um, Certainly retail has been impacted and has experienced change just like so many other industries. And the way in which you kind of uh, market or communicate or sell into someone's home is certainly different than before. I'm interested to know from your perspective, I mean, most of us are consumers to some extent, right? And so um, we've all, we all understand the shift to, to online you know, shopping. And, 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 and I think that that wouldn't be a surprise to anybody listening. But from your perspective, what does that meant to Estee Lauder? You guys are a traditionally very high touch, you know, in-person type of, uh, of shopping experience. What have you done to kind of stay relevant and stay successful as you have done over the last 12 months? Well, it's a, it's a great question. And I think first, I just want to say this has been such a very difficult time for people all around the world. And um, my heart goes out to the families and people and my colleagues who have been directly impacted by this pandemic. I do think there are some things that have come out of it that um, are going to, we're going to take with us. Mm -hmm. And um, they, the online piece of things is, is really a big part of it. Actually, when one of the things that's interesting um, is that William Water, Estee's uh, grandson, actually built our online business, was one of the very wow. first consumer product companies to uh, start online. And um, we have, we're one of the, the very strongest in the industry um, with incredible growth rates. And I think the, the magic there is that we've been able to bring our high touch in-person approach to an online experience. Mm. And I think if you can think of online as a way to interact with your consumers, as a way to continue to build your brand equity, as a way to uh, increase engagement as opposed to just a commercial interaction, um, that is really key to growing. And that has been how we have approached our online business. And you can go, you know, most people don't know that the Estee Lauder companies has about 30 plus beauty brands in the prestige area and everything from skincare to fragrance, to makeup, to hair care. And each of our brands has got its own very, very unique DNA. But if you go on those those sites, you'll see that each one, you almost feel like you could be in a department Mm -hmm. store working with an associate, getting, getting the help you need. As we come out of the pandemic and people feel more comfortable being in person, do you see the impact or some of the innovation that's happened in the last 12 months with the shift over to digital somehow merging with an in-person experience? 
I do. You know, it's a it's a great question. And I think there are just so many things that we can we can all take away from this. And I'll talk about a few of those in a moment. But on the commercial side, one of the things that you will all recall that that China was the first country to experience the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And our business in China is amazing and incredibly strong. And one of the things that we quickly moved to was something we call social selling. So our beauty advisors um, who normally would be working with their consumers and are either our freestanding stores or department stores actually moved to an online and a phone way of connecting. Yeah. So they brought those relationship skills and those ways of, of connecting um, to different formats. And, um, and the business has just completely taken off to even greater heights. So that's something that I think we'll absolutely learn. I think um, certainly all of us have realized we've got our sort of individual hacks um, of what worked well during this really difficult time. And um, when you think of a, an omni-channel experience, having the option of buying something you know, online, but also having the, the personal touch, it's very, very powerful. And I think it goes a long way to building wealthy. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that there is uh, there's certainly going to be some takeaways. There's been lots of things that were learned over the last twelve months. Clearly, a lot of 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 hardship, but I think sometimes yeah. also when there is struggle and and when there is change, we do we do improve and grow. So I think that is yeah. the positive way to look at it. I'm interested from your perspective. What are some of the ways you think that we? What, what are some of those lessons that 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 we can take away from from this pandemic? Well, I, I would just say personally, one of them is that um, not that I ever thought we were machines, but I think mm. I used to sort of go at a, almost a machine like pace. And one of the things that I have learned um, that I have really enjoyed, actually, is the ability to slow down a bit. Mm. And um, I now start most of my meetings with just talking to the team mm -hmm. and talking to my colleagues and finding out how people are and how their children are and how how the teaching is going and i think you know we really i had missed so much just being able to you know see a team in the meeting and to talk in the hallway and grab a cup of coffee with someone and ask about how someone's first date was um, and i'm so fortunate i've got an amazing team and predominantly of of young women um, and many of whom are young mothers. And mm. um, I, my daughter is 27, so it was a long time for me that I had small children. But I remember how incredibly tough it was. And that was when everything was great. Mm -hmm. um, and so really trying to help people achieve some semblance of work-life balance, which honestly I think is is a myth. I think, you know, Balance is maybe the, not the right word, um, but but having a little bit more of a boundary, um, it was has really been important, and I hope very much to bring that back when we mm -hmm. are all together. Um, I think the other thing that we showed is that people can work remotely and be incredibly successful and productive. And so um, I'm sure that you will find that that many of us will do a hybrid of working from home and working from the office. And, and you might even find some you know, yoga pants still that persist until the post COVID uh, world. But I think that's also nice. I think, um, you know, to be able to have a, a, a variety of ways of dressing and expressing ourselves and interacting um, is really, really beneficial. But I, I do think for me, most of all, um, the care for each other and the care for the individual and really appreciating people's individual circumstances um, has meant a lot to me. And I think it's meant a lot to, to my team. And that's something that I don't want to let go of. That's awesome. I love how you say yoga pants. This makes me think I we I interviewed the chief science officer for for Lululemon and I was unaware that they made men's dress clothes. But after talking oh. to him, I, I bought some some of the I'm wearing some Lululemon men's dress pants right now. And it feels like I'm sitting in yoga pants. So well, I think that I mean, that's I, you yeah. just shared something with me. Dress pants. I have not um, I have not actually worn dress pants in over a year. So um, <laughs> that's good to know that that's an option. So I'm sure they're really comfy. 
They're very comfy. Yes, I have not tried out their actual yoga pants, but I can imagine that this is must be somewhat of what they feel like. I did want to ask you though, while I got you on the podcast, with your with your position being in corporate communications and knowing that we've all just gone through this incredible amount of change, you know, I think a hot topic, a hot button word, and it has been before even <coughs> COVID, was change communication. Right? Is how do you communicate change across an organization? And I think often that's looked at as being an internally an internal communication. But I think when we were doing our planning call, you said often there's not a huge difference between the way you communicate internally and externally. Yeah. So I'd be yeah. interested to know, you know, what advice do you have for business leaders that are going through a lot of change right now? They're trying to figure out the right strategy to kind of come back out of this this crazy last 12 months. And they're trying to make sure that they're communicating effectively and successfully to their team. Well, a couple of things. Um, change is a constant. Mm. Change is something that we all need, myself included, need to embrace and realize is is interwoven into every moment of our day and life. Mm -hmm. And I think when we can put it in that perspective, it makes it a little less scary and it makes it um, makes us think differently about how we interact and certainly how we communicate. Um, you know, I've got a, a, a dear friend and mentor has a great expression. Um, if, if you're not rocking the boat, you're not moving. Change is about rocking the boat and it's about moving and that can be uncomfortable. But I think if you're an organization that normalizes change and normalizes that that in order to grow and to thrive and to innovate and to bring in and help your best people grow and develop, change is a part of that. And um, so I have have sort of pivoted to realizing that we're always doing change communications, right? So what are we doing when when we communicate? We're we are imparting information, and we are hoping that somebody. Um, has some kind of action or reaction, right? And so that's about changing. Um, and that can be changing in a small way or changing writ large. So I think when um, when we think about that and we think about it as a company, when you look at all of your stakeholders, where whether it's employees, investors, NGOs, partners, consumers, your board, um, you're always going to want to be asking yourself, what am I solving for? What am I mm -hmm. trying to communicate? And we're always trying to communicate um, really how we're growing, what we're learning, what the benefit is. And um, and sometimes the benefit is, is a benefit that's far away. And sometimes the benefit is one that is we might experience the next day. Um, I think the most important piece of it, though, is really knowing your audience mm -hmm. and really knowing where they're coming from and what their point of view is before you, um, not to sound crass, but sort of try to ram change down somebody's throat. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to set the context and it's important to show what the benefits are. And, and mostly it's important to show what are the tools and the capabilities you're going to provide to ensure that that people can change and it can actually be a beautiful thing. Mm. Mm, I love that because you're right. I think change is scary for people. People like to be comfortable, right? And so the change could be outside of comfort zone and that yeah. is therefore sometimes scary. I think people that resist change, it, you know, is it, that's because it's a constant, like you said, they're yeah. going to be in a bad situation because it's going to happen whether they like it or not. So it's right. interesting to think, is it, something that you accept, that you just acknowledge it's happening and you go with it, right? Or is there an aspect, and I think maybe you had alluded to this in, in, in what you just said, is that you can actually look forward to it. You can see it as opportunity. You can turn it into innovation and you can say, this is great for us. You know, this is our future. This is where we're heading. Um, yeah. Really interesting to think about that on a couple different levels, I think. Um, I, I loved know, it. One, one thing, George, I would just say, and I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no. you, but I think part of that, right? Um, I think to take away any fear mm. is that um, you've got to foster a place where it's okay to fail. Mm, where yeah. And we've got a wonderful expression um, that our CEO, Fabrizio Freda, believes in and, and reinforces every day. 
fail fast and fail cheap, right? <laughs> so try new things. They're not all going to work and that's okay. We have to try new things to anticipate change, to adapt to change, to make sure that we're changing in the best way and the right way. And we're not going to always get it right. Mm -hmm. But it is important to have an environment where it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us today can look at where those moments where we've learned the most they're not from our successes. They're from the bonehead things we did or the, you know, the big bets that we took or the the directions we went in that were just wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that's wrong in a, in a negative way. They just weren't, they didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important, especially as leaders to foster that environment for your team. I mean, and we talked about your, your young children. I mean, you think about a child learning to walk. They yeah. walk two steps, they fall on their bum, they get up again, they walk a little bit more, they hit their head, you know, and 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 that's part of the process. And I think we as, as people and as leaders and honestly as human beings have to embrace that. And it sort of goes back to what I was saying at the top of the call. Um, nothing in life really is totally linear. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat crooked. And you'll have moments of acceleration and you'll have moments of, of going in one direction and then somehow you'll regress. And I think we get a little um, upset about that when that happens because it is sort of strange and scary, but that's part of the process. And again, that to me goes back to the importance of bringing the humanity back into the workforce and bringing humanity back into how um, we interact with each other and respect and understand, you know, people's lives and what they're going through, because you're going to bring out the best in people when you've got those lines of, of open communication. So well said. And you've given, you've given so much great advice already. I feel almost guilty asking you for more, but every episode we end the show by just asking a couple quick questions that are a little bit more personal uh, to, to you as a leader. Um, and so I'd love to finish out just by uh, a, a little rapid fire Q and A here. Sure. Uh, as it relates to your success uh, as a professional, has there been a resource that has been extremely valuable to you? Well, actually, I would say in the in the last 13 years at Estee Lauder, the most valuable resource has been the the more junior and younger members of my team. Mm. And there is so much to be learned <laughs> from the incredible younger people that we know and are lucky enough to work with. They're a different generation and they're they grew up with social media. They are natives. We are not. And so I find so much pleasure and get learned so much every day by working with them and asking them questions and finding out what they're reading and what they're watching and what they're listening to. And I think that um, that's a really untapped resource. And I think for us, we've got an incredible reverse mentor program at the company. Um, it's part of our secret sauce. Mm. Yeah, that that's the first time I've heard somebody say that. And it makes a ton of sense because clearly there's a lot that the younger generation can learn from the experience of those who have come before them. But I love the fact that you guys are also looking back and even calling it a mentorship, reverse mentorship. That's Absolutely. so cool. Cause you're right. It's a, it, each generation certainly has something to teach and you know, the others. Um, how about, from a leadership perspective, is there a quality? And I think you've listed a couple of them during this conversation, but is there a certain quality that you've seen successful leaders share as a personality trait? Yes, I, I think that um, I, I always assume that uh, especially senior people joining my team are very experienced and have expertise in the field of communication. Mm -hmm. What I always look for is people's how how they interact with others, how they treat others, how they collaborate, how they integrate, how they listen. And I think that EQ is incredibly important um, mm. in the world of, of that we live in anything, right? Nothing is black and white. And so the gray is where we find incredibly interesting answers. Um, but you can't get to the gray unless you're really listening and asking the right questions and doing it in a way where people feel feel safe and secure and want to share with you. 
Mm, well, that's awesome. All right, final question. Let's say you were retiring right after this call. <laughs> what would be a piece of wisdom or advice that you'd want to leave behind to let you know future leaders or up, up and coming professionals know about? We, to me, the most important thing is to bring others up with you. Mm. And I have been so fortunate throughout my whole life, really, to have amazing people that have helped me and who answered questions and have been mentors. And um, I feel a huge responsibility, especially with young women, to bring other women leaders and people up with me um, because that's our future. And mm. in turn, I want them to do that for the people behind them. And so I think that we've got a responsibility and an accountability to do that. And along the way, it's so much fun and it's so enriching for everyone. Well, it sounds like the uh, young women on your team are very lucky to have you. This has been an amazing conversation. I appreciate that you've even shared with me. I feel like I know the Lauder family a little bit better. You've talked about three oh, of them. And yes. I mean, well, it's, I'll, send, I'll send you a copy of Leonard Lauder's fabulous book, The Company I Keep. It's oh, really wonderful. Cool. full of amazing leadership lessons. Well, this has just been such a treat and a privilege. Thanks so much for your time, Alexandra. It's been wonderful. Thank you, George. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.